Density and pressure are going to be the topic in this first lesson in a chapter on fluids and solids in my new general physics playlist, which when completed will cover a full year of university algebra-based physics. Now we're going to start off talking about density, we'll move on to talking about a related topic of specific gravity, and then we'll introduce pressure. We'll talk about its definition, we'll talk about fluid pressure, including how we measure fluid pressure, uh, and then we'll finish the lesson off talking about Pascal's principle and the hydraulic jack. My name is Chad, and welcome to Chad's Prep where my goal is to take the stress out of learning science. Now, if you're new to the channel, we've got comprehensive playlists for general chemistry, organic chemistry, general physics, and high school chemistry. And on chadsprep.com, you'll find premium master courses for the same that include study guides and a ton of practice. You'll also find comprehensive prep courses for the DAT, the MCAT, and the OAT. So we'll start with the topic of density. And uh, density is uh, symbolized by the Greek letter rho. This looks like a funky P, but it's the Greek letter rho. So, and it's equal to the ratio of mass over volume. And so you could say the density is proportional to mass, but inversely proportional to the volume. And it's something that most of us kind of inherently have an intuitive understanding of, but don't quite always enunciate it correctly. And so we might say like, well, if I had a you know piece of gold and a piece of styrofoam, I might like, well, the gold's heavier. So, and maybe that's true, but that might not always be true when we're trying to say that it's more dense. And the idea is that you can say heavier if and only if you're really comparing two objects of exactly the same volume because then it really will come down to which one has greater mass and therefore greater weight. So, but otherwise you really wanna use the terminology more dense and less dense. So, but if I did have an equal size ball of gold and an equal size ball of styrofoam, the ball of gold would definitely be heavier and it would be heavier because the density of gold is higher. But again, that presumes I've got equal volumes. But even if I had a small ball of gold and a very large, huge ball of styrofoam, the gold in that case may not end up being heavier, but it would still be more dense. And that's why I just want to specify the, the distinction there. All right, so if we take a look at the SI units, so the SI unit for mass is the kilogram and for volume is the meter cubed and the SI unit for density is the kilogram per meter cubed. Now, in addition, you are definitely on the hook for knowing the density of water. And if we take a look, the density of water is equal to 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. So, and that is something you're definitely supposed to memorize. And technically, this is the density of water at four degrees Celsius in the liquid phase. So the phase is gonna matter. It turns out uh, solid liquid gas, the densities are all different amongst the phases. So when you go through a phase change, the density inherently changes. So in the case of water, water is rather unusual. When you freeze water, so the solid phase is actually less dense, and we learned in chemistry that's due to hydrogen bonding. But this is abnormal. Typically, as you go from liquid to solid, most substances, 99.99% of them, get more dense. And so if you take, you know, say, solid alcohol and put it in a solution or in just pure liquid alcohol, it sinks. And that's true for most substances out there. When you put the corresponding solid in the liquid, it sinks, but not for water. Ice floats. So it has important ramifications for life and, and the way the earth works and things of this sort, uh, but definitely true. But big thing here is that solid versus liquid versus gas, big differences in densities. The other thing you should realize is that gases under most conditions have way, way lower densities than solids and liquids. So for a gas, there's usually huge amounts of empty space in between the molecules, but this also makes them fairly compressible in comparison to liquids and gases. You can jack up the pressure on a gas, and as you jack it up, it's gonna get more and more dense because you're forcing the molecules closer and closer together. But if you start jacking up the pressure on a liquid or a solid, there's not a lot of empty space, and it will get a little teeny bit more dense as you start you know, increasing the pressure, but you've gotta have huge, significant increases in pressure to get marginal changes in the density of a solid or a liquid. So solids and liquids much less compressible than the corresponding gases. All right, one other thing to note, uh, it's common, especially in chemistry, but in the context of physics, it will come up a time or two to start seeing densities in a little bit different unit. In chemistry, we're much more commonly gonna see them in grams per cubic centimeter. So, and as a result, you're gonna to wanna to make sure you be able to convert them. So, and it's one of those conversions that we alluded to back in chapter one that students struggle with sometimes and, and screw up. And, and it's not the conversion of grams to kilograms, it's the conversion of centimeters cubed to meters cubed. But we'll start with that conversion of grams to kilograms here. So we'll put grams there, kilograms there. So and in this case, one kilogram is 10 to the third grams. So, and indeed those grams will cancel. So, so far so good. But then in converting centimeters cubed to meters cubed, 
students often, the big mistake they'll make is they'll just convert and use the conversion from centimeters to meters. So, and that's where we have the problem because we don't have centimeters, we have centimeters cubed. Now, if you were gonna do centimeters to meters, the most common way a textbook's gonna present this is one centimeter is equal to 10 to the negative two meters. But notice the units don't cancel. Centimeters cubed and centimeters don't perfectly cancel. And what you've gotta do is actually cube the entire conversion factor. This cubes the numbers and the units. And so really this turns into one cubed, centimeters cubed, all over 10 to the negative two cubed meters cubed. And one cubed is still one, but 10 to the negative two cubed is 10 to the negative six. But now we'd have the appropriate units to where the centimeters cubed would indeed cancel. So don't forget when you're dealing with units of either area or volume and you've got either length squared or length cubed, you've got to either square or cube your conversion factors as well. And so in this case, we're gonna divide by a thousand, but then we're also gonna divide by 10 to the minus six, which is the same thing as multiplying by 10 to the six. And so by the time you divide by 10 to the third, but also divide by 10 to the minus six, overall, you've multiplied by a thousand. And that's why this comes out to 1,000 kilograms per meter cubed. All right, so that's the density of water, and it should be no surprise here. It turns out uh, the kilogram was originally defined so that the density of water came out to 1,000 kilograms per meter cubed. So it's not just like, wow, what are the odds that it came out to exactly 1,000? Uh, you should also note that it's 1,000 kilograms per meter cubed at four degrees Celsius. So it turns out uh, that the density within a phase is not gonna change a ton as you change temperature in most cases, but it will change a little. And so this specifically applies to four degrees Celsius, uh, but it's really close to 1,000 at most other temperatures as well. So not the biggest deal. Now, if you're given water at a specific temperature with a corresponding density provided, instead of being 1,000, maybe it's 999.73 kilograms per meter cubed at that temperature, great. But otherwise, you're just supposed to assume that the density of water provided, if it's not given to you, uh, but if it's in the concept of a problem, is 1,000 kilograms per meter cubed. Okay, we've also got to talk about a related topic, which is specific gravity, which I'll abbreviate SPGR here. And that just takes the ratio of the density of a substance relative to the density of water. And so by looking at the specific gravity, you can really quickly tell, is this substance more dense or less dense than water? Or uh, uh, randomly, uh, pure coincidence if it has an equal density to that of water. But if this ratio is exactly one, well then that substance has an equal density to that of water. But if this ratio is greater than one, then it's more dense than water. And if it's less than one, then it'll be less dense than water. And we'll find out that in the next chapter, knowing if something's more dense or less dense than water is super convenient to figure out if it's going to sink or float when you place it in water. If it's more dense than water, i.e. if its specific gravity is greater than one, then it will sink when you place it in water. We'll learn that in the next lesson again. But if its specific gravity is less than one, its density is less than that of water, it will float when you place it in water instead. So this idea of specific gravity has some practicality associated with it. Uh, but the big thing you realize here is that it really is just giving you a relative density to that of water. If you get a specific gravity, again, equal to one, same density as water. A specific gravity of two would mean that substance's uh, density is double that of water. Specific gravity of three, triple that of water. Specific gravity of 0.5, that substance's density is half of that of water. So that's kind of how that works. That's kind of what you should have in your head. So let's take a look at the first problem here on the handout. And first problem says, uh, the density of liquid mercury is 13,600 kilograms per meter cubed. What is its specific gravity? We're just gonna plug it right into the formula here. And so in this case, that specific gravity is equal to the density of mercury, 13,600 kilograms per meter cubed, all over the density of water, 1,000 kilograms per meter cubed, which is gonna get us a specific gravity of 13.6. And notice there's no units, the units cancel here, so specific gravity is unitless. And seeing a number of 13.6 just means that liquid mercury is 13.6 times more dense than water. So next here we're gonna talk about pressure and we've got a, a mathematical definition here. So it turns out pressure is force per unit area. We take a look at the SI units. The SI unit for force is the Newton and for area is the meter squared. And it turns out the Newton per meter squared is what we call Pascal and Pascal is the SI unit for pressure. Now, 
Uh, it turns out there's a variety of different units you might use. In a chemistry context, we might more commonly use, say, like atmospheres or something like this. And so there's some things you might want to know regarding uh, uh, some of the different conversions. So it turns out that one atmosphere, so and it's so named the atmosphere because at sea level, that is atmospheric pressure. And one atmosphere expressed in SI units would be 101,325 Pascal. But you might also see this in a couple other ways. So you might see it instead as, you know, kilopascal. Since this is such a big number, you might see 101.325 kilopascal. Or you might see something like 760 millimeters of mercury, or in the chemistry context, maybe even 760 tor. And we'll find out that this 760 millimeters of mercury is related to uh, looking at a mercury barometer, which we'll take a look at uh, a little bit later on. So, but some of the different conversions, you might be given uh, non-SI units and have to convert to SI units before you're doing some calculations. So here in the US and like industrial applications, we also like to use pounds per square inch. And typically if they're gonna ask you uh, something involving pounds per square inch, they're gonna give you the conversion so you can convert it to Pascal, not typically something we leave students on the hook for. All right, so if we take a look at this definition for pressure, we see that pressure is proportional to the force applied. So no big deal there. Students don't usually struggle with that idea. But here's the one that's a little bit uh, unintuitive maybe, is pressure is inversely proportional to the area over which it's applied. So, so we're applying a force over area, and greater force, greater pressure, but smaller area over which that force is being applied and a greater pressure as well. So for example, let's just say, you know, I have some students who get to the end of their college careers and they've listened to all my videos and they're like, no offense, Chad, but I'm just sick of the, t you know, sick of your voice. Sick of the sound of your voice. Okay, so fair enough. So sometimes I'm sick of the sound of my voice too. So, and maybe you're so sick of the sound of my voice that you wanna stab me with a dry erase marker. Okay, so not the greatest choice in the world of, of something to stab me with, but maybe you wanna stab me in the arm. You don't wanna kill me, you just wanna you know, injure me because uh, you're tired of the sound of my voice. And so you stab me with a dry erase marker. And my question for you is, are you likely to puncture the skin stabbing me with a dry erase marker. Probably not the highest likelihood. You might be like, well, what if I stab you, Chad, with as hard as I can, with the greatest force possible? Well, that will lead to greater pressure, but you're probably still not going to puncture my skin. Because bad choice with the marker. If you want to puncture the skin, you should have chosen something with a smaller surface area over which that force is being applied, because then you get a greater pressure and maybe enough pressure to puncture the skin. Maybe something like the tip of a knife or something might have been good, but I'll, I'll prefer it if you just use the dry erase marker or if you just don't stab me at all. So, but pressure again is proportional to force, but inversely proportional to the surface area over which that force is being applied. Okay, so that's pressure. Let's talk about fluid pressure now and get this in that context. So, so fluid pressure, if you kind of take a look, uh, you know, right now there's an atmospheric pressure and the idea is that there's a whole atmosphere above me of air that's weighing down on me. And as it turns out, as you go higher and higher up in the atmosphere to higher altitudes and stuff like that, the pressure goes down because there's less air above you at that point weighing down upon you. And so you might think of this, this column of air above you weighing down upon you and the, the greater the weight of that overall column of air, the more pressure, so the greater force it's applying to you and the greater pressure you'll experience uh, at that particular location, things of a sort. It's also why as you dive down into like say a swimming pool or a lake or the ocean, that also the pressure goes up as well is because as you're diving down, you're gonna have a, not a bigger column of just air now, but also a bigger column of now water above you as well that also is going to you know contribute to that pressure as well. And so the greater the weight of the column of fluid above you, and in this case, fluid might apply to just not just liquids, but also to air gases as well. And the greater the weight of that column, so the greater the pressure at that particular location. And we've got a lovely equation for this. So looking like so. In this case, uh, the density of the fluid matters. So it turns out like air is way less dense uh, than liquid water. And so if you, you know, go 10 meters further down uh, into a canyon, the increase in pressure is really negligible. But if you go 10 meters further down, say in a lake or in the ocean, it is a pretty significant increase in pressure, about a one atmosphere 
increase in pressure. And the reason is really coming down to density. The density of liquid water is way higher, probably close to a thousand times higher uh, than that of a corresponding gas, so like of air or something like that, a mixture of gases. So, but density of the fluid plays a role and then gravity. Uh, and then how deep is that column you're going into? So, and in the case of uh, air, you know, we'll typically not use this sort of a calculation, but we'll much more see it, uh, much more likely see it in the context of diving down into a fluid. And again, most commonly water, but again, it could be other fluids as well. So, uh, but probably not in the context of a person diving down to that fluid. Uh, but this H doesn't necessarily sound for height. So you could look at it as the height of the column of fluid above you, which is really the depth of how far down below the surface uh, the location is of where you're measuring that pressure. So we often call this the hydrostatic pressure or the gauge pressure. So we got to talk about that for a second because if you've dove down into a lake or something like that, it's not like the pressure was zero before you dove down, especially if you started at sea level. Before you dove down, the pressure was already one atmosphere. So you already had a column of air above you. And so as you dove down, you now have a column of you know, fluid right above you, water in this case, and then air above that. And you've got to factor those both in to get what we call the absolute pressure. And so you have to factor in the atmospheric pressure, P-naught, here first. So then plus the corresponding gauge pressure. And that's a really terrible looking row there. And so this is what we refer to as the absolute pressure instead. So be careful on a problem. Are you being asked to calculate the gauge pressure, also called the hydrostatic pressure, i.e. the fluid pressure, or are you actually being asked to calculate the absolute pressure, which takes into account that gauge pressure plus the atmospheric pressure on top of that. So be careful. All right, so let's take a look at a couple more questions here involving pressure. And first one's just gonna involve the definition of pressure. So. A man replaces his normal shoes, whose soles each have a surface area of 100.0 centimeters squared, with snowshoes, whose soles each have a surface area of 3,000.0 centimeters squared. By what factor does the pressure under his feet change as a result? So a whole point of wearing snowshoes is that you're much less likely to sink down into the snow uh, and things of a sort. So, and it turns out because you're trying to decrease the pressure by having a much larger surface area for those snowshoes, a larger surface area results in a lower pressure. Again, there's that inverse proportionality for the relationship there. And so in this case, as the area is going from 100 centimeters squared to 3,000 centimeters squared for each shoe, that is a 30-fold increase in the surface area of the soles. Well, 30-fold increase in the surface area is gonna to lead to a 30-fold decrease in the pressure, and that's ultimately the answer. And if you just can kind of understand relationships and inverse proportionality, life is good. You can also kind of plug it into a, a calculation here, and you could say, okay, so pressure is force over area. So, and in the case of where you're wearing normal shoes, well, the force is half the weight per shoe, right? So half of mass times gravity, that's the force. And then over an area, in this case, I'm just gonna leave this in terms of 100 centimeters squared for a second, but we should technically convert that to meter squared if the goal was to actually get the pressure in Pascal, but we're not actually gonna calculate any sort of pressure here. Now the pressure in the second case is gonna again be the same force, one half mg, half the man's weight, all over 3,000 centimeters squared. And the question is by what factor did the pressure change? And so we'll take, we'll call this P1 and we'll call this P2. And now we'll just take the ratio of P2 over P1. And we're gonna get 1 half mg over 3,000 centimeters squared all over 1 half mg all over 100 centimeters squared. All right, take a look at this. The force part doesn't matter. That force is the same in both cases and just cancels. So the units here are also gonna cancel. And we're just looking for what, by what factor did things change? And so it really just comes down to three th uh, the 3,000 and the 1,000. So P2 over P1 here is gonna equal, by the time you divide by one over 100, same thing as multiplying by 100. So you're gonna get 100 over 3,000, which equals one over 30. And there's again where we said that that 30-fold increase in the area, the surface area of the shoes, results in a 30-fold decrease in the pressure so that it's only 1 30th of that original value. All right, the next question says, a snorkeler dives to a depth of 20.0 meters in a freshwater lake. 
whose surface is located at sea level, what is the absolute pressure at this depth, and then what is the gauge pressure? So you bring us for the absolute pressure and the gauge pressure both. Again, for a lot of questions, you'll probably ask for one or the other, and you gotta be sure which one are you being asked for, the gauge pressure or the absolute? But in this question, we'll find both. Now, one thing to note here, so uh, under hydrostatic pressure on the table on your study guide, so it says that every 10 meter depth in water is 100,000 pascal, roughly, uh, and which is approximately one atmosphere. And again, one atmosphere is just over 100,000 pascal. So every 100,000 pascal, is roughly an atmosphere. And it turns out as long as you're diving down in water, every 10 meters you go down is roughly an additional atmosphere of pressure. Nice rule of thumb. So you can ballpark things and we'll see why that works out here. So take a look at the gauge pressure. So again, rho G H. In this case, if we use the density of water, thousand kilograms per meter cubed times gravity, which is close to 10 meters per second squared, and then times 10 meters, You'd see if we rounded gravity up to 10 meters per second squared, we'd have a thousand times 10 times 10, which would be a hundred thousand. And so in this case, that's why every 10 meters you go down is roughly, in this case, it's technically 98,000 Pascal, but that's about a hundred thousand Pascal, which again is really close to one atmosphere. And so a good rule of thumb that every 10 meters you go down in water is an additional atmosphere of hydrostatic or gauge pressure. Well, in this case, we're actually going down 20 meters not 10, and that's why it's gonna be at roughly an additional two meters of gauge pressure. So the gauge pressure should be roughly two meters, uh, two meters, two atmospheres. So, but we also were doing this at sea level, so the atmospheric pressure is one atmosphere, so plus the additional gauge pressure of two atmospheres, we should get an absolute pressure of roughly three atmospheres, which again would be right around 300,000 Pascal and a gauge pressure of around 200,000 Pascal. But let's do the calculations here. All right, so in this case, we've got our gauge pressure, and I'll even specifically write that, gauge pressure. So 1,000 times 9.8 times 20. Uh, and in this case, that's gonna get us 196,000. So, and we want three sig figs, it has three sig figs, life is good, and that's in Pascal. And again, we said it should be around two atmospheres, and two atmospheres would be around 200,000 Pascal, and that's around 200,000 Pascal. If you actually converted this to atmospheres, it would be just under two atmospheres. And then we want that absolute pressure as well, which again is going to equal atmospheric pressure plus that gauge pressure, which I'll write it a little differently this time around because we already know the gauge pressure. And so in this case, so we know that the we're at sea level, so atmospheric pressure, and it's 101,325 Pascal plus that gauge pressure of 196,000 Pascal. And now we can see this absolute pressure comes out too. Let our calculator do some work. Uh, actually, I guess we could do this in our heads. So 196,000 plus 101,000 would be 297,325 Pascal, which in three sig figs would be simply rounded down to 297,000. So now we'll take a look at two classic devices for measuring pressure, the manometer and the barometer. So it's real customary to use a very dense liquid uh, in these, and the classic dense liquid was definitely mercury, still real commonly used in this day and age. So the mercury manometer here, so is used for measuring the pressure of a gas. So if you did some sort of, let's say, chemical reaction and you collected a gas resulting from that chemical reaction, you might collect it in one of these lovely manometers. So, and as you produce more and more gas, it's gonna exert a greater and greater pressure on the mercury that's in the columns of this manometer. And as it presses down on the fluid on this side, it raises it up on the other side. Now, the other side, though, is open to the atmosphere. And so you've got atmospheric pressure here pushing down on the other side. Well, in my example here, you can actually see that the uh, pressure of the gas must be pressing harder than the atmosphere is because it's pressed down further on the left than it is on the right. So it turns out there's a simple formula for calculating that pressure, and this formula should look a little bit familiar. So, but it's pressure equals P naught plus rho G H. So the way this works is the pressure at the same level on both sides of the manometer is going to be the same. And so the pressure right here, which is due to the gas, 
should equal the pressure on the other side of the column as well. Well, on the other side of the column, there's two contributions. There's the weight of, again, all the air above, i.e. the atmosphere. There's also the weight of that column of fluid right there. Well, the weight of that column of mercury is equal to rho gh, as we learned. And so the overall pressure on this side should equal p naught plus rho gh. On this side, it's the pressure of the gas, and they're equal. And so the pressure of that gas that we collected is equal to p naught plus rho gh. So simple calculation in this case. Now, in the case that oh, we should actually specify here, so this h here is that difference in levels, the difference in the height of the two levels of fluid on the two different sides of the manometer. Now, if you look, if the side where the gas is, is lower, so then you're actually, the pressure of the gas is higher than the atmospheric pressure by rho gh. But if it, this were reversed and the other way around, so then the pressure of the gas would have been lower by the atmospheric pressure by rho gh, and you would have subtracted instead. Okay, so let's see how this works. So question on your study guide here says, what is the pressure of the gas inside this mercury manometer pictured above if H equals 380 millimeters? All right, so in this case, we got the pressure of the gas. It's gonna equal P naught, atmospheric pressure, 101,325 Pascal plus rho GH. And in this case, so density of mercury, if it wasn't supplied, we'd have to look it up, but it's 13,600 kilograms per meter cubed times gravity, 9.8 meters per second squared, and then times that height. In this case, it was given as 380 millimeters. We'll find out why that's important in a little bit when we talk about the barometer, but we wanna convert that to meters. And 380 millimeters is 0.38 meters. So and from there, it's plug and chug with our calculators. So in this case, we got 101,325 plus 13,600 times 9.8 times 0.38, and we get 151,971.4, which if we round to two sig figs would round down to 150,000. So let's write the whole thing down. So 151,971.4 Pascal, which will make 150,000 Pascal for two sig figs. Okay, so barometer has a similar setup here. So a little bit different, but similar and, and functions in a similar fashion. So in this case, we're gonna have, instead of a gas trapped inside of a lovely uh, tube here, it's actually gonna be evacuated completely, have a vacuum where the pressure is zero. So, and then this lovely uh, container down here is open to the atmosphere. And so we have the atmosphere pressing down on the fluid here, but there's nothing pressing down on the fluid in the column. And so that's why it's gonna rise. So. And in this case, how much is it gonna rise? Well, it's gonna rise in such a way so that the pressure here, which is equal to atmospheric pressure, as we see, is also the same. But in this case, right in the column, it's equal to the, uh, the weight of the height of that column, in this case, once again, of mercury. And so we're gonna identify H here once again. Uh, and in this case, for the barometer, so the pressure that you're measuring is actually atmospheric pressure in a way. So and so P naught here is gonna equal rho GH, where once again, if you're using a mercury barometer, plug in the density of mercury, gravity, and then H here is just the height of that column in that barometer. Cool, let's do this. And uh, in this case, one thing to note, if your atmospheric pressure is exactly one atmosphere, you'll find that it would, act, that it would actually raise up a column of mercury exactly 760 millimeters. And so it became customary to use that actually as a unit. So, and actually express pressure in millimeters of mercury. How much does it rise a column of mercury in millimeters in a barometer? And so that's where this last unit comes from, where one atmosphere equals 760 millimeters of mercury from this classic barometer. And so question on your handout says, what is the atmospheric pressure for the barometer pictured if H equals 800 millimeters. And so in this case, if H is actually 800 millimeters, well, that's a little bit bigger than 760 millimeters, which means we should expect the pressure to be just a little bit bigger than one atmosphere, a little bit bigger than 101,325 Pascal. So we can ballpark it, but let's do the actual calculation here. And so in this case, P naught equals rho, and again, 
I'm counting on the fact that mercury's density is given on the other side of this study guide. So if it wasn't, you'd have to look it up. It's not something you typically have to memorize. So times 9.8 meters per second squared, and times that height again, in this case, 800 millimeters is 0 0.8 meters. And so the atmospheric pressure at this particular location, so 13,600 times 9.8 times 0.8 gets us 106,624 Pascal. And we want to round that to four sig figs in this case. And so we'll make that 106,600 Pascal. So the last topic of this lesson is going to be Pascal's principle and the hydraulic jack. And the way a hydraulic jack works is you're going to have some fully enclosed hydraulic fluid here. So, and there's two sides, and they're not all exactly engineered exactly like the drawing we have here. So, but the drawing is really uh, helpful for kind of showing how it exactly works. So the way this works is we're going to push down on one side, and as we push uh, down on this side, we're going to apply a force. And as we apply that force and push this side down, that's gonna cause the fluid level on the other side to rise, lifting up a car or something else like that with our hydraulic jack. Now the key is this is a fully enclosed fluid. So in Pascal's principle simply states that uh, if you do something to alter the pressure anywhere in a fully enclosed fluid, that will actually be transmitted throughout the fluid. Another way of stating that is that the pressure everywhere in an enclosed fluid is the same. That's gonna be the deal here. So if we press down on this side, applying a force per unit area, we're applying a pressure and it causes the pressure of the fluid inside to go up and it causes it to go up everywhere, including over here. And that increase in pressure is now gonna apply a force upward on the area of the piston in this cylinder, causing it to rise. And so, Increasing the pressure on this side increases the pressure on the other side as well by exactly the same amount. So one way to look at this in terms of Pascal's principle would be P1 equals P2. The pressure on this side of the hydraulic jack equals the pressure on this side of the hydraulic jack. Another way of writing that though is recall that pressure equals force per unit area. And so you could say that F1 over A1 equals F2 over A2. And this is most commonly how you're gonna see Pascal's principle mathematically written for a hydraulic jack. F1 over A1 equals F2 over A2. And a lot of students look at this and get it exactly backwards. But the deal is this, so if the pressure is the same on both sides, well the right hand side has a way bigger area, as you can see where we're trying to lift that car. And to keep the pressure exactly the same, if you have a much, much larger area, let's say your area is bigger by a factor of 100, well, then the force is going to have to be bigger by a factor of 100 as well in lifting that car. And so now a much smaller force on the left-hand side that you're pushing down with will ultimately generate exactly the same pressure, but a much larger force on the area with the bigger, uh, I'm sorry, on the side with the bigger area uh, as we'll see. So that's a big part of, of the hydraulic jack and the way it works is Pascal's principle expressed just like this. And typically uh, you're going to solve for maybe, you know, how much force it takes to press down to lift up a car, which is exactly what we'll do here in a second. Uh, but there's one other concept you got to realize here. And so uh, as we press down over here, so it's going to cause the volume in the cylinder on the left hand side change. So uh, and it's going to decrease as we press down by an amount H. And actually, I guess I should define this not as H, but D more properly in this section. So we're going to displace the fluid, and that's going to cause that volume to go down. But that's going to cause, on the other side, the volume to go up and cause a displacement on that side. But you can see that the displacements are not going to be equal. What will be equal is the change in volume on this side will equal the change in volume on this side at least in magnitude. On this side, the volume's gonna go down. On this side, the volume's gonna go up, so one's positive, one's negative, but the magnitudes have to be exactly the same because as it goes down this side, that fluid has to go somewhere. Well, it goes to the other side, giving an exactly uh, a rise in volume by exactly the same amount. But again, the volume is not gonna be equal. I'm sorry, the volume will be equal, but the displacements are what's not gonna be equal. Well, if you recall, like if you have the volume of a cylinder, so the volume of a cylinder, and that's essentially our volume change is that of a cylinder on both sides in this case. And the volume of a cylinder was equal to pi r squared h, if you recall. 
And way you could look at that as well is it's equal to the area of a circle times the height over which it changes as well in this case. So that's the volume of a cylinder. Uh, area of a circle times the height of the cylinder. Well, in our case, we've really got the change in volume is gonna equal the area of a circle, which again was that pi r squared, times the displacement of the piston inside that cylinder. And that's ultimately what we're gonna say. And again, the volume changes are exactly the same in magnitude, even though one's positive, one's negative. And here's where, this is not a statement of Pascal's principle, but another uh, equation that's gonna to apply to our hydraulic jack, that A1, D1, i.e. the change in volume on one side, is gonna equal the change in volume on the other side as well. So let's see what kind of questions might, might we be asked in this context. All right, so, and you have to put up with my, my lovely illustrations here, again, my lack of artistic ability, uh, but my little generic car up there, in this case is going to weigh 1,600 kilograms. Uh, the radius on this side is given as 10.0 centimeters, the radius on this side given as 200.0 centimeters. All right, so we got nice lovely uh, cylindrical, uh, round cylindrical cylinders here, radius given on both sides. Let's read the question. For the following hydraulic jack, how much force must be applied to the smaller side? So where again the radius is 10.0 centimeters. In order to lift a 1600 kilogram car on the larger side where the radius is 20.0 centimeters. Now, a couple different ways to look at this. We said earlier that if you had 100 times more area on the right-hand side, then it would generate 100 times more force. And so a lot of students see this and like, oh, 10 compared to 200, that's 20 times more. So it should be 20 times more force, but you gotta be careful. We talked about if it's 20 times more area, then it's 20 times more force. But again, these are radiuses, that's not the area. And again, the area is that cross-sectional area of the cylinder which is that of a circle, which is pi r squared. And so let's see how this calculation works out. So we've got F1 over A1 equals F2 over A2, which again, F1 over pi r1 squared equals F2 over pi r2 squared. And that's ultimately the calculation we've got to work with. Notice the pi's are gonna drop out. And so even though we can see over here that uh, the radius is indeed bigger by a factor of 20, the area is gonna be bigger by a factor of 20 squared, the radius squared by a factor of 400. And so you can kind of ballpark this already. You can say, oh, well, if it's 400 times more area, that's gonna be 400 times more force on this side as well, which means 400 times less force on this side. Well, 1,600 kilograms for a mass that's around 16,000 newtons and, you know, uh, 40, what do we say? Uh, 400 times less force, my bad. So 20 squared was 400. So 400 times less force than 16,000 newtons would be right around 40 newtons. So we can ballpark this in our head before actually performing the calculation if we understand Pascal's principle here. Let's work this out. So F1 is ultimately what we want to solve for. And so in this case, F1 is going to equal F2, which again is mg. So that's 1,600 kilograms times 9.8 meters per second squared, all over R2 squared, which in this case was again that 200.0 centimeters squared. So, and then up here, we've got the 10.0 centimeters squared. Now you might be like, Chad, you never converted to SI units. And you're right, I didn't. And we could, we get the same answer either way. The units are gonna cancel here. We're gonna have centimeters squared here and centimeters squared here, and it's just gonna cancel. And so as long as we use the same units, it wouldn't matter which set of units we use for length squared, i.e. area, in this case. So, but if, even if you decided to convert this and made this 200 centimeters would actually be two meters and 10 centimeters would be 0.1 meters, and then you square them both still, you'd get exactly the same answer. So it didn't matter in this case. All right, but let's see what F1 comes out to. And again, we said it should be somewhere right around 40 Newtons. So 400 times less than 16,000 Newtons. Let's see what it comes out to exactly here. So 1,600 times 9.8 divided by 200 squared and then times 10 squared gets us 39.2. 
newtons. So let's see how many sig figs we want here. Uh, looks like we want three sig figs. It's got three sig figs. Life is good. All right, second relevant question here to this same setup here is how far must the smaller side of the jack be depressed, i.e. D over here, uh, for the larger side to raise a car by one centimeter? So a little different question here. And so, whereas we said force and area end up being directly proportional. If the area goes up by a factor of 400, then the force goes up by a factor of 400. But here, if you look at area times displacement equals area times displacement, here they're gonna be inverse proportional. If your area on one side is gonna be 400 times bigger, then your displacement's gonna to have to be 400 times smaller to maintain this equality. And so in the, this case, I know I want one centimeter raising of the car. On the other side then, because it's 400 times less area, it's gonna be 400 times greater displacement, which is gonna be 400 centimeters or four meters. So well, let's do some plugging and chugging here. So once again, we've got pi r1 squared times d1 equals pi r2 squared times d2 of 1.0 centimeters. Pi is gonna cancel yet again. On this side, we've got 10.0 centimeters squared times D1. On this side, we've got 200.0 centimeters squared times that one centimeter. And we can now let our calculator do the work for us. So we've got 200 squared times one, but divided by 10 squared, and we are indeed gonna get 400. And so in this case, D1 is going to equal 400 centimeters, which to get the proper number of sig figs here, three sig figs would be 4.00 times 10 to the second centimeters, which is four meters as well. Cool, so no free lunch here. So even though you get by with using a lot less force where you apply, uh, uh, that you have to apply to the jack to raise the car, so you've got to push it down a lot greater distance in order to raise up that car. So that's why, you know, if you're using a jack at home and jacking up your car, you're cranking on this thing over and over and over again and watching that jack just ever so slowly go up. That's kind of the deal. So you're, you're having to use less force than it takes to raise the car itself directly, So, but you're having to do a lot greater displacement on that side. If you found this lesson helpful, consider giving it a like. Happy studying.